I think that um, insisting upon coordination of care is the responsibility of the caregiver and the patient. She had literally four different specialists in her room at the same time. They were standing right there and they were arguing. And having a very, very clear understanding of what their wishes are if they don't make it is what you need to need to do. A lot of people you go into the hospital and they don't know what their what their mates or their loved ones are taking and um, you don't know what the hospital is giving them. I think it's an assumption by most of the general population that if you need medical attention you go to the hospital, you go to the doctor, they're going to give you all the medical attention you need, all the guidance that you need. That's not necessarily going to work that way. I believe mostly because of the sheer volume of people that are going to those doctors, going to those hospitals. They can't be personal patient managers. They can't stop their world and only focus on that one patient. That's going to be the responsibility of that primary care taker because that is the only person that they're focusing on where the hospitals, the doctors, everybody involved, they have thousands of people to focus on. I would go to every test that she went to, I would quiz every technician that she had as to what they were doing, <laughs> why they were doing, what's that, what's the sound that I'm hearing, what's happening in this echocardiogram, what's going on. You know, even though they're not supposed to, if you're really nice, sometimes they tell you things they shouldn't. <laughs> I tried to be at every one of his appointments. I asked a lot of questions, so every time blood work would come back, I was asking the different questions about the blood work, and every time there was a test returned, I wanted to know. I asked those questions because it was important for me to understand, so that when things started to change, I knew that something was right or something was wrong. When we first found out, that he was really sick. We went to a lawyer and we had uh, durable power of attorneys for medical purposes, for financial purposes and everything else because I realized that I was gonna have to do some things without him because he wasn't gonna be capable of doing them. Oftentimes the primary caregiver is really the liaison between the person with the illness and the outside world. And so in that role and in that capacity, they may need to make sure that they are on all of the lists at the hospitals and um, the, the friend and family list, and that they, in fact, assist the person that there is a medical power of attorney, a legal power of attorney, and that they know and assist the person with the disease, that their will is in order, all too often, these documents are not ready um, when the patient needs it. Doctors don't have to talk to us. Actually, they can't because of HIPAA laws. But if you trust the person that's caregiving you, you need to give them that right and authority. When you're at home, you have so many questions for the doctor. And then once you get to the doctor's office, it's like, yeah. boop, it's gone. it's gone. You know, yeah. you can't remember what you were gonna say. Write down all of your questions before you come to a visit. Keep a written list of all the medications and bring that with you to every visit. Keep a written list of your weights, your blood sugars, all of these things that you track on a daily basis and bring that with you to every visit. I have to be on top of things. Record keeping is key. I found that, um, keeping a binder. I had one binder for all the finances, everything. And then I had another binder that had every, every time he went to the doctors, I had a medical binder and it lists all of his medications and those things all in one spot. So it was one less thing that I had to search frantically for when I was asked for something. She works right now with three different computer systems and she doesn't want to. She works with Sparrow system, she works with MSU system and the U of M system and she's going, I can't handle three different yeah. computer systems. Unfortunately, our healthcare system is very complicated and can be difficult for patients and their caregivers to navigate. Uh, this is made worse by the fact that patients may go to one doctor in one health system and another doctor in another health system and a third doctor in a third health system. And there's no big medical record system in the sky, so the records don't necessarily always share. And so all these physicians may be unaware of what the other is doing. Hopefully that will improve in the future, but for now, 
it's really incumbent upon the patient and the caregiver to try to coordinate all those visits and that care. One way to do that is to carry your binder with your records everywhere you go. When you get tests done, ask for the results and put it in your binder and you can carry your own medical record with you. Most importantly, keep a list of all the physicians you see and make sure that all the physicians know the name and contact information for all the other physicians. Insist that your doctors call the other doctors so they can have a communication. Um, that's something that we're always happy to do, but we may not be aware that, that we need to uh, unless you tell us to. The liver disease affected so much more than I ever imagined. Kidney, I mean, like it wasn't just this little box that they gave to you. It's the liver disease. No, it is a whole body. She has a lot of other medical issues. And so we, you have to, figure, first of all, narrow it down to figure out what, what issues you're dealing with if you can. As if liver disease were not complicated enough, uh, many patients also have other medical problems such as diabetes, some have heart problems, and so that makes it more difficult to deal with because they need to uh, know what medications are supposed to go with what disease, which doctor to call, often they'll have multiple specialists, and sometimes the specialists will give conflicting information. So uh, that can be more of a challenge for caregivers as well. When someone receives conflicting information from different doctors, uh, that puts them in a very difficult situation. It can be very awkward and scary. Uh, the way to deal with that is, first of all, to know the disease and be able to know what medications are for what different diseases. Secondly, the caregiver has to have the confidence to be able to call the doctor and say, you know, Dr. So-and-so has said this, but now you're saying this. Can you please tell me how to reconcile these two uh, conflicting information? She has to take a relatively high dose of oxycodone in order to deal with some back pain. And when encephalopathy kicks in, it's hard to differentiate to know if the person has taken her medication right, because what we found out is if she misses two doses, she goes into withdrawal symptoms, and withdrawal symptoms are almost identical to encephalopathy. And I made that concern known, and everybody in the profession said, yeah, you're right, it'd be pretty hard to tell. But I can tell now. I can tell now, and that's only because, like I said, we went through it several times, and we see the signs. So somebody that's coming into it green without any background is probably really going to feel like they're out there alone and they're confused and they don't know the right way to go. But experience, as usual, is the best teacher. Her first line of defense is her family doctor. If she starts feeling sick or whatever, she calls them. If they, at that point, either over the phone or seeing them, they say, okay, this is something beyond us, we either then go to the specialist or they send us to the hospital. Particularly when patients have multiple medical problems or multiple specialists, uh, definitely when they're geographically distant. In other words, perhaps the primary care doctor or gastroenterologist may be in their hometown and then you have the liver center that may be far away. It's often difficult to know who to call. It's even more complicated if the patient has a cardiologist, a kidney doctor. So the way to do that is to first know the disease and know what symptoms go along with the liver versus the heart versus other things. Secondly, ask the doctors, in this scenario, what should I do, who should I call, and uh, get guidance. I think I called too much, but I was always reassured by the team that I wasn't calling too much. So I could usually tell. He would tell me when something was wrong. He would tell me when something was bad. He would tell me, I'm not feeling well, I'm running a fever. He had swelling and he had the edema and he had all of those things taking place. But when he became lethargic and I, I came home and he was lifeless, it was like, okay, we have to get you to the ER now. When her encephalopathy gets bad, um, our only alternative usually is just to go to the emergency room. I mean, she's that impaired. And, and so um, it's not that we call a doctor and say, you know, what do we do? It's she wakes up and, you know, she can't dress herself, she can't walk, she can't do anything, and so it's go to the emergency room. The problem that I have with our hospitals is that our doctors don't see her when she's in the hospital. Um, they only have a hospitalist that sees her. 
So therefore, we're dealing with a hospital doctor who then has to relay to our doctor, and then we have the doctor here. So there's really nobody coordinating anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be nice to be able to see her doctor when she's in the hospital rather than somebody that doesn't know her. And when she was going in there repeatedly, you get tired of going through the same thing every time That's you're true. in the hospital. I mean, it's, why are you here? Well, the same reason we were here last month, you know? Transitioning from the hospital to home is, is a very uh, difficult experience. Uh, there's a different care team, medical team in the hospital than as outpatient. Sometimes the information doesn't get transmitted properly. And uh, this is at a time when patients are often at their most vulnerable. So the caregiver needs to learn how to manage that transition. Uh, and they manage the transition by being there at the time of discharge, asking lots of questions to the care team there, writing down, getting written information so they can take that to the outpatient doctors, and trying to make sure that the patient gets a follow-up appointment uh, as, as soon as possible, or at least a follow-up phone call, just to check in and see how things are going. The hospital gives her certain prescriptions and in orders for drugs that are different than yeah, her yeah, doctor right. mm -hmm. gives her. Mm -hmm. And so then you go to the doctor and they say, well, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Well, that's because the hospital told us this is what we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. The medication list that the patient should receive when they get discharged from the hospital is the list that the patient should be following, but sometimes the hospital team doesn't always know what the patient was on before, for sure. And again, this is where the caregiver has to always bring a written list because no doctor can tell what the patient's putting in their mouth every day. Uh, the only way we know that is what the patient or caregiver tells us. So when the patient's discharged from the hospital, of course they have a list of medications. The caregiver needs to go over this and see what's different from before and ask questions about why things are different. If there's any remaining doubt, uh, it's best to bring that list to the outpatient doctor and say, hey, this is what we were told, what do you think?